Most saints and avatars and all that don't write. That is true. Whatever they say, that becomes praman. Praman means the authoritative word. And see, Puja Gurudev also did not write extensively. Many of these books which you see, Kaivalya Upanishad, he'll talk on Kaivalya Upanishad. And somebody will scribe that thing. That is it. So, his teachings through his most immortal words we are seeing. Now this is number nine, uh, number ten. We saw number nine last night. So, this great teacher and world guru lived five or six hundred years ago, long time ago, in the place called Varanasi. And, of course, we say lived, but they are immortal. They don't ever, they are never born nor do they die. Ajo nitya shashvato yam puranaha ajaha they are unborn. And they manifest from time to time across this earth to teach humanity in various ways. Such was the great Kabir Sahib who came at that time, who manifested at that time. So, here is now number 10. Yahatan Bishki Belari Guru Amrit Ki Khan Shish Diyo Jo Guru Mile To Bhi Sasta Ja Shish Diyo Jo Guru Mile तो विषय सस्ता जान यह तन विष की बेलरी गुरु अमृत की Bishiki Belari. This body is a, a vine or a repository of all Bish. Bish means poison. Last night I was telling you about this word poison. Poison the body. Now, this, where is it going? Well, this is going in this direction. Let me just lay the foundation for this type of teaching. The direction is the jiva, the individual being, is nothing but part and parcel of an infinite reality. This is first thing, right? Please get these points straight, then you will know where this verse, where this sakhi fits in there. The jiva is a part and parcel of an infinite reality. Call it Brahman, the absolute. Reality, call it so many words, whichever word you want to name, you want to call. Right? But this jiva, who is supposed to then realize his oneness with an infinite reality, that is called as Sarvatma Bhav. Sarvatma Bhav means his feeling of oneness with the entire universe and all things in the universe. That is called as Sarvatma, Sarvatma Bhav. So he is supposed to have Sarvatma Bhav. Feeling of oneness. What he has? Dehatma Bhav. Dehatma Bhav means he has feeling of oneness and identification only with his body. And how big is his body? Hundred and whatever pounds. Five feet five, five feet ten. 
So he has Dehatma Bhav when he's supposed to have Sarvatma Bhav. And because people don't have Sarvatma Bhav, they, and we were talking about on one of the previous days, we don't have Sarvatma Bhav, so we discredit things. And we, think, we think these things are not important, these things are less, these things are useless, like that. And we only think that we are important. We don't identify with all beings and things in this universe. So, so many things are not important. And after we kill them out, then we realize they were important. This is this human being. He kills out everything. Then he kills out all the insects, kills out all the bee and all. Then he realized, but they belong to a very important chain, you know. I kill them now. Know what to do. There is no Sarvatma Bhav. He doesn't have any. Uh, that, uh, big arms to embrace the whole universe and identify with all things as part and parcel of his own being. Yes, the Atma Bhav. So now, the human, one of the human basic problem is his identification and attachment to this body. So every strand of spirituality which comes from India, it doesn't matter which sampradaya we belong to, every strand talk about detachment from this body. And that's why it goes on reminding all of us. And see, you have to remember also, the reason why people don't like death is because of the separation from this body. Nobody wants to give up the body. Everybody wants to go to Swarga and heaven, but they don't want to give up the body. So you will go just like that or what? <laughs> you will go with the body? <laughs> so the, all the traditions and sampradayas of India, they all of them in some form or fashion talk about this body. So first they talk about body. Second, they talk about this body in a very despicable way. Adhama, ati adhama sharira, Tulsi Dasi writes. This body is despicable. You have not thought about it. This is how to de develop detachment from this body and disidentification with this body. It is despicable. You have not thought about it. That is why you, you don't think so. But I'll, I, you, now you will have to think with me. Suppose we take a, a line, right? A closed line from that wall to this wall. Closed line and get closed clip also. And then we get a, a few boxes of Ziploc bags. Zip lock bags, right? So from this body, now we're going to dissect the body. From the body, we take out all the different things and we put in zip lock bags. So here we put all the blood and all the flesh and all the hair and nails and teeth and bile and enzyme. And pus and hair and all the intestines and the contents of the intestines. <laughs> you line them up here and you walk down the line. Which one you like? <laughs> Which one we like? Some people, when they see blood, they faint. Have you seen? When they see blood only. Which one of these things we like? If you are eating and you see one hair in your food, what happens? Even there's your own hair. Much less if you see a fingernail. How despicable every part of this body is. So despicable, actually. But Prakriti or Nature has a, an enchantment about it. You know, when Prakriti weaves all of these things together and, and put it in a package. You know, the packaging is a very big thing nowadays. The package is worth more than the, the product inside. So the package, when this packaging is done with this body now, and you say, 
Ah, wow, wow, wow. Without you, I can't live. Just now when you watch you there with all of these things. You don't like any one of it. One fellow, huh? he had sandwich phobia. You know sandwich phobia? Sandwich, sandwich. He, and whenever he saw a sandwich, he used to get almost heart attack. So the mother took him to a psychiatrist. So the psychiatrist pulled out now from a drawer a slice of bread, put it on his hand. He said, what is this? That boy said, bread. <laughs> he took out a slice of cheese. What is this? Cheese. He put it there. <laughs> He took out a slice, a, a, a leaf of lettuce. What is this? Lettuce. He took out a slice of tomatoes. What is this? Tomatoes. He showed it to him. Nothing. He took out a slice of bread. Another slice. What is this? Bread. He put it there. Ah, sandwich! He ran away from that bread. He ran out from that place. <laughs> Look here. Singly, he's fine with each one of those things. But when you put the things together, he gets. See, that makes any sense? No, in other words, phobia has no logic, no reasoning, no sense, no nothing. Phobia means only phobia. People have all sorts of, look here. Some people have, recently I saw one person, Guti phobia. <laughs> you see a little gu a Guti. <laughs> a baby a Guti. Oh, the baby a Guti is the most cute little thing. It doesn't do anything to anybody. But phobia is just phobia. It has, it has no relation between the capacity of the thing and the person. It's just a phobia. A little goody cannot do anything to anybody. So phobia has no logic, no rhyme, no reason, nothing. Right? So singly, when he sees each piece of that sandwich, no problem. When you put it together, phobia. This exact same thing happens in the reverse now with his body. Nobody likes any part of this body. Dermis and epidermis. <laughs> I know one person, if you move your kneecap like that, they faint. <laughs> They'll faint if you move your kneecap. You know your kneecap can move? So, any part of this body, any bone, any skull, nothing, nobody likes. But when you put it together, somehow that thing becomes so there. Yes. Hmm? And human beings, we go one step further. After Prakriti puts it together, all these despicable things, Prakriti put it together, then the human being now, he also, he dresses it up even more. He adds his bit. So Prakriti made it look good, so now he has to make it look more good. And like this, the human being gets identified with the body, attached to the body, when he's supposed to have Sarvatma Bhav, he has Dehatma Bhav. So now see, see the line, Yehatan Vishiki Belari. This body is only filled with poison, every part despicable and poisonous. Nobody wants anything, any part of it. And now, means to say our attachment and our love for this body and identification with this body and body culture. Today it's called body culture. Have you heard that word? Body culture. The world is now centered only on this body. Deha. Dehatma bhav. Huh? Everything is surrounding the body. 
And half the world want to put on weight, and half want to lose weight. And half want to burn fat, and the other half want to build muscles. So he goes and, goes and lifts that dumbbell. I don't know how to get that word dumbbell. <laughs> Buddy, yeah? So now, he said, Guru Amrit ki Khan. The body and everything associated with the body is filled with poison. And everything associated with the Guru, he is the very mind, storehouse. Khan means storehouse, mind. Repository, reservoir of what? Amrit, nectar. So body is like poison and guru, everything about guru is like nectar. One is poison, one is nectar. And we have body culture only. She should dio jo guru mile to be sasta jan. And if I have to give my head to that guru to get Amrit, that is a cheap price. If I have to give my head to the Guru to get Amrit, that I, I got a bargain. I get a steal of a deal to give my head. Give head means what? You know Ravan cut off head by head to give to Lord Shiva? Yes. That's why Lord had to bless him only. The idea is symbolically that I should be so willing to do anything for the Guru to get Amrit. I should be so willing, willing up to the point of willing to give my head. That also is a cheap price. That is the idea. And that is the only way the person will get this Amrit. There is no other way to get this Amrit. So many people feel, feel that we can know. No, 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 no. I, we'll be self-taught. I will be self, I am a self-taught man. You might be self-taught in this thing or self-taught in that thing or self-taught. See, it is easy for, to be self-taught in so many different things in this world. Self-taught in agriculture. No problem. You be self-taught in agriculture or fixing cars. There are many mechanics learn to fix cars by fiddling with cars only. I know one man, he took down a whole engine by himself. I said, what are you doing? I'm going to fix my engine. <laughs> when he put it up, back, he remained with a bucket of parts. He don't know where the parts are going. <laughs> After putting up the engine, one bucket of parts remaining now. Where does this go? He had to go and call a real mechanic. <laughs> so, a person fiddling like that, he might learn. But in spirituality, no chance. For this type of philosophical depth, what is required is a guru. Hmm? Bina guru. Tulsi das, you know? Guru bina. Without guru. Bhava nidhi tarai na koi. Nobody will cross over. So, if we have to get the nectar of immortality or enlightenment or realization, which the Guru is the very embodiment of. If we have to get that, we have to be so willing, willing to the point, I am ready to give my head. Huh? Now, one more thing. Give head, you know. Head is the seat of ego. Ego means I have to be willing to give up my ego. Totally. Ego is the problem every, all the way down to the end. All the way down to the wire, the problem is ego. Eh? You know how, how long far that ego goes? Somewhere down the end also, he's wondering, I wonder if this guru really knows what he's saying. That's ego, you know. His ego asserting itself there, rearing its head. I wonder if this guru really knows what he's saying. Anytime that type of thing comes, the ego is just all the way. So, we have to be willing to give up that ego totally. Huh? All right. Now, next, 
Next, uh, Doha talks about Nindak. Nindak means those people who bad talk you. What a nice solution in the next Doha for people who bad talk us. And one more thing. In this world, there will always be somebody who will bad talk you. Eh? Don't think. Look here. There are people who say things about Ram. There are people who say things about Krishna. There are people who say things about Buddha. So who, is, who are you and I? There are people who say things about everybody. Who are you and I? So there will always be somebody in this world who will ill speak us. Hmm? So now, this next uh, Doha gives a nice solution. Saib gives a very nice solution for, for this. When people ill speak us, what to do? See the directions. Nindak niere rakhiye Angan kuti chawaye Bina pani sabun bina Nirmal kare suha Nindak niere rakhiye Angan kuti chawaye in Pani Sabun Bina Nirmal Kare Suhaye Kabira Nirmal Kare Suhaye Kabira Nirmal Kare Suhaye Nindak Nere Rakhye Nazdik Nazdik Par Rakhye Nindak means a person who will speak. Keep him close. How close? <laughs> keep him close, he says. Anybody who is speaking you, keep that person close. How close? Angan kuti chawaye. Right in the courtyard of your touch hut. Right there. In your veranda. Under your, in the veranda, a little part extending outside right there. Keep him right there. So close. Hmm? Why? Well, just now we taught, just now we were telling that we have to give up this ego. The ego is what we have to give up now, represented by the head. So when we keep this nindak very close, he says, bin pani, without water, sabun bina, without soap, without water or soap, nirmal kare suhai, that fellow will make you pure. He will make us pure, without water and soap. Oh, no. What is the meaning then? It means to say that we should be happy and glad when we meet somebody who will speak ill about us. Because what he is really doing is he is chipping away at our ego. Someone may ask, when the person speaks ill about me, I should not... See, when people speak ill about other people, they remove them. Isn't it? They eliminate them. You're saying this about me and saying that about me and saying the other thing about me. So we try to eliminate. You should not try to eliminate. See, keep him close. Let him say a few more. Let him say a few more things. When he says a few more things, that thing chips away at our ego. Every time he says, says that is chipping part of the ego. You know why? Because in this world, everybody feels that they're too important. Everybody feels that they're too great, too important, too elevated, all that kind of thing. So when the Nindak speaks bad things about us, that chips away part of that ego, you know. And chipping away, chipping away when he speaks bad things every time, then I will become Nirmal. Nirmal means pure, my ego will go. The, the converse of that makes the whole thing clear. What is the converse of that? The converse is, if everybody goes on praising, 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 what happens to the ego? Every each time we get a praise, so the nindak is the opposite. Every time we get a praise, there's a nice story in Balkan of Ramayana. I have to tell you that. Naraji, one day, Naraji came 
to Himalayas. And he sat like this in, in a place. He found that place was very enchanting and very peaceful. You know, some places are very peaceful and calm. You feel like sitting there. You don't feel like going. So he came to some place like that in Himalayas, and then he sat like this. And he went into meditation. Now, Narad had a sharp. Sharp means a curse. Curse means he'll not be able to sit in any one place for more than five or six minutes. That's why he's going like Nara and Nara and he's going everywhere. He keeps going. He is, he is an intergalactic traveler with no passport. And he keeps going everywhere. So, he sat there for a long time and he went into Dhyan. Dhyan means meditation, deep inside, with no connection to this world. Then, Indra, he saw this Narad meditating. Indra got scared. Maybe this Narad is meditating, so he'll get mystic powers. When he gets mystic powers, he'll come here and he'll take over my kingdom. He, he got scared because of that. So, Indra quickly called Kamadev. Kamadev means the god of, he called Cupid. Cupid, Cupid, you know? You fell over the bow and arrow? Cupid. Cupid, cute, and not stupid. That is Cupid. So he came to disturb this Narad. Then what happened? He came there with his mythical arrow and everything, and tam, he shot that Narad. There's arrow of love. And Narad was not in this wee bit moved. Narad just sat there. Then, after a long time, Narad opened his eyes and realized that Cupid had tried to disturb his meditation. So, Cupid got very scared now because he thought after Narad opened his eyes and sees me, after Narad opens his eyes and sees me, he'll burn me to ashes. So he got scared. So when Narad opened his eyes and he said, Oh, my dear Cupid, nice to see you. How are you? I mean, Narad did not get angry. So, he already conquered Kama, because he's, Kama is lost and all his desire and all of this. Who's Kama Dev? Cupid. He conquered Kama. No, he did not get angry also. So he conquered Krodha. Krodha means anger. He conquered Kama, Krodha. And he told to Cupid, he told to Kama Dev, you go and tell Indra, I don't want his kingdom. I'm not interested in his kingdom at all. So he conquered Lobha, let me greed. Greed for kingdom and money and Khazana means the treasury and everything. He conquered calm, crowd, and lobe in one stroke. So, <coughs> in Bhagavad Gita, you know, Bhagavan says, these are the three doors to hell. Trividam naraka siyadam dwaram nashanam atmanam kam krodha tatha lobha. Kam krodha lobha. Three doors to hell. And in one stroke, Narad conquered all three. So, after Kamdev left to tell his boss, Indra, Narad is not interested in your kingdom. He left to tell that. And he's glad because Narad did not get angry. Because if he said he got angry with him, he'll. He'll burn him just by a look. So anyway, Kamde was happy to vacate that place as fast as possible before Narad changed his mind. So he went away. Then Narad sat there now. See now, eh? I conquered calm, crude, love, desire, anger, and greed. But nobody knows this thing. And Lord Shiva himself could not conquer uh, these things. So I better go and tell Lord Shiva. 
Lord Shiva could not do it, but I did it. So I better go and tell. So he goes straight to there, that place. Kailash. And he said, Prabhu, you know I conquered Kam Kurud Lo. <laughs> Bhagavan said, that is a good thing. And immediately Bhagavan said, but I don't want you to go and tell to Lord Vishnu. So Narada thought, you see, I did better than him, and he doesn't want me to go and tell Lord Vishnu because he will look bad. Because I outdid him. So he doesn't want me to tell Lord Vishnu. So Bhagavan Shiva said, don't tell it to Lord Vishnu. And if you go to visit Lord Vishnu anytime, and that topic come up, change the topic. <laughs> like that he told, eh? If that topic at all comes up, change the topic. He went there and no topic come up. He bring up the topic. <laughs> and he told Lord Vishnu that I conquered calm, crowed, love. And Lord Shiva tell me, don't tell you. <laughs> well, Bhagwan Vishnu realized that his ego became And the Lord contrived an elaborate plan and program to wipe out his ego. And that thing was so painful. That story is a very long story in Balkan. That was so painful that Narad became so hurt, so devastated, and so angry. And this is the same one who just conquered anger. Eh? And so angry that he gave a curse even to Lord Vishnu. So the idea, the idea is, this process of removing this ego is a big, long process of removing ego. And here, Saib is giving a very nice, nice tool to start, because you see, human beings like praise, we like commendation, we like respect, we like attention, we like all this type of notice. This is called a locationa. And any time anybody praises, notices, comments, and gives all of these nice uh, words, and they butter you up and all. That time the ego gets Bigger and bigger. Therefore, he says, anytime anybody is speaking evil about you, keep them close. Let us speak some, some more. That will chip away at the ego. Because if we don't do what happened, you know, Bhagavan call it Totra Vetrai Kapanaye. Totra Vetrai Kapanaye means one who has a whip in his hand. So Narad had an opportunity to remove his ego on his own. So it's a painless thing. If we remove our ego on our own, that is a painless thing. We do what is required to remove that ego. But when we don't, Prakriti has a whip. Prakriti means nature. Nature has a whip. That's why the Lord holds a whip in his hand. He symbolizes that thing. Nature has a whip, and that whip will whip us into shape. That whip that ego out. So therefore, he says, instead of casting out the nindak, keep him close. Let him go on saying, you know, I think you're really foolish and ugly too. <laughs> because everybody, see, they, everybody feels they're smart and everybody feels they're good looking. So if they index, they're in that, I think you're foolish and ugly too. And don't talk about how you just dress. They're done ugly already and so you just dress too. Even in that tell you that, that will go on chipping away that. Otherwise, we have ego, our identification, ego with his body, with our intelligence, with our looks. These are the things people get. All this great, great sense of superiority with these things only. Spirituality is a very demanding thing. Eh? Very, very demanding. So, a very nice thing. Nirmal kare is so high. Without any of... See, bina pipani, bina, sabun bina. That symbolizes, means without any effort of all 
higher things. Higher things means what? You have to go and learn Sanskrit and you have to memorize this text and memorize all these spiritual um, rules and laws of Prakriti and Maya and Brahman and all of it. That means without any of those things. This Ninda, just by speaking evil about you, he'll chip away at your ego. Ego gone and you don't need all this. Because ego is the problem. Ego is the main problem. It is that ego which prevents us from getting knowledge also. No man, I know already. Ego saying, I know already. You don't know better than me. Ego speaks like, see? So like that, keep him close. And here is a very famous This is the whip we were talking about just now. Prakriti has a whip. Dukh me sumiran sab kare Sukh me kare na koi Jo sukh me sumiran kare Kahe ko ho Dukh me sumiran sab kare Sukh me kare na ko Jo sukh me sumiran kare Dukh ka ko ho Kabira Dukh ka Dukhme sumiran sab sumiran means remembrance of God. Sumiran means remembrance of God. Dukhme sumiran sab kare. When people have sorrow, calamity, disaster, pain, misery, anguish, when we have any of these afflictions, they are called hmm? klesha in Sanskrit. Any klesha. That time he remembers God. This this sakhi goes very very deep. Many elements are involved in this. I'll tell you one. So this, this let me tell you word meaning first. So this is word meaning. Dukhme sumiran sab kare. Everybody remember God in times of afflictions. Sukhme kare na koi. When there is joy and happiness and pleasure, no, nobody remember God that time. Then, jo sukhme sumiran kare. Those who remember God in times of joy and happiness. So dukh kahe ko hoy. How will they ever have sorrow in their life? So people wait till sorrow comes, then to remember God. So you know that. But they say, when the horse run out, then you close the stable. Have you heard? But anyway, now I'll tell you something very important here. Just now the topic came up about Spiritual evolution. How the topic came up? I told the spiritual evolution means the removal of the ego, right? We have to chip away at our ego. But that has to be done voluntarily by us through attending satsang and studying the scriptures and studying the nature of reality and God and worship and prayer and all the different, different methods and japa and meditation. Countless sadhanas are there, right? So I will remove that ego. But people don't do. Countless spiritual practices that people don't do. So, when we don't do, then nature has its own way. Prakriti and nature has its own way by whip. So, that's called disaster and calamity and all problems like that, right? That time people remember God. The idea is, though it is, the verse is telling, we should voluntarily enter the spiritual path and get, move along the path, the verse is also telling another very important point, and that is a truism which is there in the world. And I'll tell you what the truism is. No organism, be it a unicellular organism like an amoeba, or a very complex organism like a human being, no organism evolves without stress in the environment without 
misery, sorrow, pain, pressure from the environment, stress from the environment. That truism is captured in the verse also. That is why in times of happiness, nobody worships God, nobody thinks about God, nobody thinks about higher philosophy, nothing. But in time of sorrow, when there is stress, pressure, affliction, that, that time the person thinks. <laughs> One fellow was an atheist. Atheist, you know, lawyer, lawyer. Lawyer was an atheist. Now he's, he gets sick one day suddenly. Never believe in God or anything. See, he's called Agnascha Shardhanascha. Tamshay Atma. Last night we were talking about that. So, in hospital now he gets sick and lie down in the bed. Somebody going to see him. Another atheist lawyer going to see him. Told him, friend, another atheist. When he reached the hospital, he see he reading our Bible. He said, what? You reading Bible, why? He said, yeah. He said, why? He said, I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> You're looking for loopholes. Let me have you look for loopholes in the law. Maybe I might slip through. But when there is sorrow, pain, disease, misery, it is that anything, that time everybody becomes spiritual and all. So the idea is, don't wait till it is too late. That is one idea. But the other idea is which you should take. Huh? Otherwise, people ask the rational for sorrow in the world. The rational for sorrow. What, what good is sorrow? Sorrow is of absolute importance. Sorrow is by how we evolve. No human being evolved by anything happy or joyous. Why? Because karma breeds karma. Desire breeds desire. Bhagavan says in, in, in Gita that desire is like this. If you have a desire for something and that desire is fulfilled, the desire doesn't go away. What happens? It gets stronger. Like when a fire is lighting and you add ghee. So when there's a desire, right, like a fire, and you, you have a desire for this object, right? And that's a fire inside, that desire is a fire. So you give the object, that desire gets more. Then no joke, eh? Let me just, I'll just demonstrate that thing for you. You give anybody in this world a million dollars today. You give him a million dollars today. And tomorrow you come back and you say, here, I have another million for you. You tell me if there's any human being on this earth with No, 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 no. I get a million yesterday already. It's okay, you keep that one. Yesterday I don't get one. Anybody will say? Even if you're thinking, you'll say. When you really come, when the crunch comes down and you get the next million, you will not say. I don't want it. Because the, the, the rule of the human being is the more we get, the more we want. The more we get, the more we want. And that goes for everything. House, land, property, money, anything. So, to fulfill a desire is really to fan the fire of desire. That is the idea. Eh? So, if, I, if life is happy and all the time my desires are being fulfilled, that person is not evolving. His desires are becoming more and more. But when there's stress from the environment, there's pressure, there's uh, agitation from the environment, when there's sorrow, and the, all of that is summed up in one word, dukkha. Affliction is summed up by one word, dukkha. That time, everybody remember the reality, remember God, remember the higher being in the universe. That time evolution takes place. Now the, the real thing should be that I use Sama and I evolve. Means to say, I should not wait till I get Dukkha to evolve. A person can also evolve by thinking deeply without getting Dukkha. But most people don't. That is the idea. This privilege is only there for the human being. The 
privilege to evolve through sukha is only there for a human being. The, it is not there for the animal kingdom. The, the, the cow cannot say, or the lion cannot say, man, look, how many animals I kill in my whole life. I'm only killing animals. And let, me, let me stop killing animals from tomorrow. I go and I join the cow and I go eat grass. You think the lion could say? I'll join the cow and eat grass. No lion will say. Because he doesn't have that privilege to say that. But a human being could say, I did so many things, you know. I killed so many. I killed this, did that. Look, look let me stop this thing. So the human being has the privilege to evolve voluntarily. But he doesn't. So then, nete kicks in. Nete dukkha, it gives. Everything in nature, it will give dukkha only. In nature, you have to work for sukha. You have to work for sukha. If you don't work, nature by itself only gives dukkha. You know that. You haven't thought of it. Look here. If you sit down here and you don't work and build a house, nature will give you what? Lightning and thunder and <laughs> rain, right? So what you have to work to build a house, isn't it? Like that, if you don't work and protect yourself, you will get all the disease and flu and this and that, everything. You have to protect ourselves. That's what nature will give all the time. So, for the person who does not voluntarily get on the spiritual path and really work towards that enlightenment, He'll get dukkha, and then only he will. But said, dukkha me sumiran sab kare. All worship God. All remember God when there is dukkha, when there is sorrow. But the person, jo sukha me sumiran, the person who voluntarily, in times of joy and happiness, and, and, and be thankful that we have health and strength and we have everything. Health, wealth, strength, everything, so that we can pursue the spiritual path. The one who does that, and is happy, and pursues, without waiting for, for nature to give up. He'll never have dukkha, never have sorrow in his life. Huh? So that verse can go on and on. Very nice it is, so, and very famous. And where is this absolute reality? Where is this reality which we speak about so much? Where is God? Where is this supreme reality? Where is Paramatma? Oh. In so many like verses, in so many similar verses, Saib has given so many of these. Jai se til me til hai Jo chakmak me aag Tera saai tujh me hai Tu jag sake to jag Tera saai tujh me hai Tu jag sake to jas Jai se til me tel hai Jo chak mak me I say, you know, where is the reality? Well, the reality is here, there, and everywhere, right? Reality, God is here, there, and everywhere. God is called as omnipresent, sarvavyapi, sarvavyapi. This is, I will end with this verse today. Sarvavyapi. Sarvavyapi means all pervasive. When we say all pervasive, in any of the traditions of India, when we say all pervasive, we mean to say that the Lord is everything. Not that there is a thing and there is a Lord who is an overseer of that thing. There is no such thing. Eh? 
This is all Western thought. They are independent things, and there is a or, or just to put it in philosophical um, philosophy of religion, how it goes. There is a universe, and there is a God who is independent of the universe, who is an overseer of that universe. There is no such thing in Hinduism. Eh? When we say the Lord is all pervasive, we mean to say that the Lord is everything. It's not that there's, there's a thing and there's the Lord. So now see this thing, what he says in, in, in now see the literal meaning. Eh? Jai se til me til hai. Til means a, a little sesame seed. Any seed. Right? Till usually is sesame seed. In that till, in that uh, uh, seed, there is tail. Tail means oil. Tail doesn't mean tail like English tail, eh? like a dog tail. Tail, oil. So in that seed, there is oil. Even now, the mustard seed, they squeeze and the oil come out. That sesame oil comes out from that only. Sesame seed. Yeah, now, next one. Jo chakmak me ag, like in a piece of wood or in a match stick or any piece of stick, there's fire in there. There's fire inside the wood. Tera sai tujme hai. In the very same way, the Lord is in me. Now, so you have to ask the question. The last phrase is very nice. We'll see just now. You have to ask the question. If you take the piece of wood, eh? take a piece of wood like this. There is fire in that wood. Which part of the wood? Well, the fire is in every part of the wood. In fact, that wood is nothing but fire. Because okay, the, the, this southern end will burn less than the northern end. No. The fire is equally present in that wood, uniformly. The examples are given to point this thing. What? The uniform existence of the reality across the entire universe. It's not that God is present more here and less there. Because otherwise people feel God is present in the temple or the church or the mosque. What about other place? No, other place we could do whatever foolishness, but here we can do. Because God is here. People think like that or not? We could do foolishness other places because God is not there. God is here. But if it's a piece of wood, fire is equally uniformly present everywhere. So there's a uniform presence of the reality. Every, God is not more present in the church and less present in the abattoir. We have all of that. One day, Hanumanji, in order to dispel this Wrong notion which we have. What wrong notion? That God is present some places more than other places. Hanumanji was passing and a fella inside the toilet. He sit down in the toilet and inside the toilet now he going Ram, 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 Ram. He chanting Ram name inside the toilet. So Hanumanji said, what is this? Of all places he going to chant Ram name inside the toilet? <laughs> he gave vex. So he wait outside the door for him. When that fellow come out from the toilet, he hit him one mukdar on him. Middle of his head. One mukdar on the middle of his head. When he, that fellow get him mukdar now, <laughs> he watch Hanumanji so. And he continued. 
he continued nothing happened to him nothing happened to him so hanumanji find that strange so he go he gone by ram now he said prabhu when he going to tell the lord you know prabhu i fell over chanting your name in the toilet he going to tell that when he reached there now he see bhagwan have a big bump in his head <laughs> he said prabhu what, what happened to you he said what happened to you he said when you hit me a mukdar <laughs> he said where where hit you a mukdar he said look here my devotee was chanting my name in the toilet and when he come out you hit him a mukdar but i take a vow to protect all my devotee wherever my devotee getting any uh, licks i go there to take that licks so you hit me so hanuman ji enacted this thing to tell you know about the omnipresence of the lord and sometimes we'll see you know because we have this habit you know the scriptures are telling that the lord is equally uniformly present everywhere and we have this habit of thinking those people are less and those people are more and you know and some in the middle and all but the lord is equally present in in all beings and he is present here as much as he is present there ah He's present everywhere in the toilet too. God is absent in the toilet. Oh, then he not serve be happy. All pervasive. The second idea of all pervasiveness is serve be happy. The all pervasiveness of a thing also means that if we really take the word to its logical conclusion, the serve be happy means the Lord is everything. not merely that he pervades everything maya tatham idam sarvam jagada vyakta murtina he says i pervade everything in an unmanifest form the whole universe in other words when you see you are actually seeing me but you are think you think you are seeing watch or the object in other words you get caught up with the nama roop the name and form quickly and you forget that it is this thing is supported by existence which is called sat sat is supported by sat so you see the nama roop name and form and you forget the existence like when you see a nice clay pot in a shop decorated nicely with chinese writing immediately you look at the color texture size shape height this that and all the other thing and how expensive it looks and and you forget it is only clay So in the same way we forget we see the nama roop and we forget it is existence huh that existence pervades the entire universe just like how the oil pervades every iota of the seed the till and the fire pervades every iota of the wood he says tera sai tujh mein hai in the same way god pervades every iota of our b now see the next line jag sake to jag if you can wake up to this reality wake if you can't well sleep we go do the idea is if you could wake up to this reality and human being i told you has a privilege to wake up to this reality of what the omnipresence or the sarva vyapitvam of reality the human being has that privilege and in other words the human being can wake up yani sha sarva bhutanam tasyam jagarti samyami bhagwan you know the the one who awakens he awakens to a new reality to which all of us are asleep we are asleep to that reality which is all pervasive right now but we have to wake up to that reality ha huh? jag sake to jag if you can wake up wake that has a it's it, it's sarcastic side of it if you can't wake well yeah continue sleeping 
but the one who sleeps, he miss, misses out on everything. Huh? A true devotee, a true sadhak, a true spiritual aspirant it is one who has a limitless appetite for life and is prepared to take up the challenges of life to reach the pinnacle of life, which is its enlightenment. So, Jag Saketo, Jag, you can wake, wake up to this reality, all pervasive reality. That person will reach the supreme only. Now, now I, I'm afraid to just flip my screen here and go to the next verse because I will love it and then I'll have to do it. <laughs> so, I'm not going to go to the next verse. I'm going to stop now and we just have a couple small things. See from here, I have a flight at midnight. So from here, I have to eat fast and 